AI is, uh, I wouldn't say is the future, AI is now, you know, so when we talk about AI, I mean, in Media Prima, when I, you know, we launched the first um, AI DJ, so, you know, when you're talking about AI, it's everything is AI, I mean, if you go to Google and you type three words and something prompts you, that's AI also, so it's inevitable, so what's going to happen is, it's going to be shift of, of resources, so what's happening is traditional, traditional operators are branching up speaking about radio i mean i've always spoke spoken about this radio is uh to me is a this is a term that you use, use uh, loosely but when i started in radio in 96 uh, we had one video operator now the vis visual team is more than the audio team so you must understand that uh, people don't listen to radio they watch radio they watch radio everywhere they watch radio through you know instagram reels carousel stories TikTok. you name it it's there you know not so much facebook it's just a thing of the past but yeah, so you have to adapt to this and I feel that what's going to happen is uh, it's going to get more aggressive in the sense that there are, there are more content content uh, producers, or con like people like you, or, you know, even this podcast is a content thing. So when we speak about long form, short form, podcast is a long form content. So yeah. as opposed to radio, which is more short form, you can punch in, punch out. So. Um, quality rather than quantity becomes a, a, a you know a mainstay you know? yeah difficult thing to balance right now uh yeah we've seen that a lot of people well, the newer generation has really shortened thing, their attention spans by constantly viewing content on youtube shorts instagram all these reels on tiktok and this is quite negative in a way for the audience because you know they're they're completely ruining their intention span. They can't even hold uh, a conversation, let's just say, for five or 10 seconds because of how they're able to quickly snap. With your experience in both traditional and digital media, how have you witnessed the transformative transformation of the media industry over the years? And what key trends do you foresee shaping its future? Um, yeah, that's a tricky question because I, I don't know whether you're talking about radio or media per se, but uh, the key, I think, changes the, um, how I would phrase this is, it's the content uh, it takes precedence over delivery. So that means if it's great content, doesn't matter where it's at, it's, it still gets listened, heard, played, you know, viewed. So, however, with digital media, I mean, if you're talking about the plethora of what's available, um, most traditional medias, I mean, most traditional media operators have to also embrace um, digital media. I mean, we've been saying this for, for youngs and, it, you know, you can see the, the downfall of um, traditional players like a uh, newspaper, printers completely die okay so and you will see it fall off um traditional tv um appointment tv where appointment setting tv where you know you see a, a certain program at a certain time has died in fact satellite tv also pay tv is also having a, a traditional satellite tv is also having its share of uh you know what i mean other problems and, and and trials and tribulations why because um simply the fact that the two things that's happening um people are being fed a lot of short form content videos yeah. okay and you know and it's and it's everybody's the producer this is with the advent of a better phone a better a device and everybody's a producer and you can you can you know um choose where you view this you know example is like i go to tiktok to you know, to to watch some of my content creators that I like, and 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 you know, um, anything from from playing a guitar to anything. So short form, you know. So educational uh, education content is very prevalent in TikTok. There's also entertainment and jokes and stuff like that. Um, Instagram is is more very showy, where people are showing off their you know what they have, what they do, and all that's very influencer based and stuff. So and every and and it gives um anybody like you and i to probably become a content producer so people actually um sort of um engaging because it allows you to engage with a content producer unlike unlike 
traditional media where it's one dimensional is one you know it's one way only so yeah so what's happening is traditional traditional operators are branching out speaking about radio i mean i've always spoke spoken about this radio is uh, to me is a it's just a term that you use, use uh, loosely but when i started in radio in 96 uh, we had one video operator now the vis- visual team is more than the audio team so you must understand that uh, people don't listen to radio they watch radio they watch radio everywhere they watch radio through you know instagram reels carousel stories tiktok you name it it's there you know not so much facebook it's just a thing of the past but yeah so you have to adapt to this and i feel that what's going to happen is uh, it's going to get more aggressive in the sense that there are uh, there are um, more content content uh, producers are con- like people like you or you know even this podcast is a content thing so when we speak about long form short form podcast is a long form content so yeah. as opposed to radio which is more short form where you can punch in punch out so um quality rather than quantity becomes a, a you know a mainstay you know yeah difficult thing to balance right now uh yeah we've seen that a lot of people well, the newer generation has really shortening their attention spans by constantly viewing content on YouTube Shorts, Instagram, all these reels on TikTok and this is quite negative in a way for the audience because you know they're they're completely ruining their attention span they can't even hold uh, a conversation let's just say for 5 or 10 seconds because of how they're able to quickly snap um you know uh in, in onto a new video or something like that uh so we've seen that uh, that is quite a negative trend in, in in that healthcare wise but if you're looking in for companies and uh all these big big um uh, multi billion dollar giants it's good for them because it's able to capture this young audience which is their primary target market or market segment that they really want uh so it's a very profitable industry and it's also giving the opportunity for young creators or innovative people to venture in and try new things uh and it's making opportunities that let's just say people perhaps of your age did not originally have and i'm not saying that in any negative way but um but now with all these type of the digital media revolution which is happening and just going to happen for another couple of years with even ai driven content coming out uh we're going to see a huge change in demand um and you know how exactly these companies are going to target um these young viewers that they have on their platforms um ai is uh, i wouldn't say is the future ai is now you know so when we talk about ai i mean in media prima when i you know we launched the first um, ai dj so you know when you talk about ai is everything is ai i mean if you go to google and you type three words and something prompts you that's ai also so it's inevitable so what's going to happen is there's going to be a shift of of resources so for example like if you can get people to i mean these days you can you can prompt and and with various tools from mid journey to you know from chat gpt to fader to you know you can get a commercial done in um in less than 30 minutes a 30 minute 30 second commercial in less than 30 minutes yeah previously it took, it took weeks maybe months so you know so there are there is going to be a very fast shift the paradigm shift is going to be so fast and companies that do not um sort of prepare for a change of resources what i mean is you ha- either have to retrain you have to replace you know uh these people so you know people like me are looking at org charts to see how we where we can move money into so it's going to happen very fast this is inevitable and the speed is going to be escalated even further uh, faster so um i don't know whether your question was about how a company is going to approach this i mean it's inevitable so some companies will not approach it you know they will take the 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 stand that you know like classic examples like how blackberry died and you talk about the kodak example is classic so unless they embrace it faster um they're going to be you know replaced yeah. a good example is is barriers to entry so you must remember that it is more very expensive for the common sme or micro sme to get into into the advertising space for traditional media it's very expensive you know even a radio commercial for a week is about 50000 depending on what station you put in but if you are 
TikTok influencer or you're a TikTok, you, you spend money on TikTok and all that, and you can start to choose your psychography, your demographic and all that. It's a fraction of that. So barriers to entry while return, uh, in, while engaging and also getting real-time data is, is so important for small SMEs. Yeah. So this is going to continue. This trend is irreversible. It's going to continue. So I wouldn't say it's a bad thing. I don't. I, I embrace technology. I embrace this change. But it is going to take a lot of, um, unless you're a digital native to actually understand this, um, you know, most most older companies with older heads are just trying to get their head over um, the shift. But even that period, the short period, can be very detrimental to them. So I guess it's got to be a mix of, you know, new and old. However, that being said, the most important thing is there are a lot of things that is very essential for your generation, my generation, every generation to come. It's great storytelling. That doesn't go away, you know. So in 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 essence, storytelling becomes pivotal, you know, whichever platform you put it in. So soft skills are still important, you know. So you notice when people gravitate to empathy, to you know, great storytelling, whatever you see. I, I saw somebody who's we just put something simple, this guy, and it was like you know, two million views, and it was just this brilliant storytelling, you know. So while we can talk about we can we can argue about um you know um technology and we can argue about best camera angles this and that and all that sometimes most of the times great storytelling wins all the time so yeah. you know if there's one advice i can give to you know companies and even people like y'all is well you know find out what you know find out your audience and find out what resonates with them and then build build the story around that yeah yeah um, it's really important that your content is relevant to the audience and that is what keeps them or wants them to keep on coming back and maybe indulging themselves or, you know, watching whatever you're producing. It's extremely yes, important. Yes and no, you know. I would say yes and no because you have to understand people know only what they know. People don't know what they don't know. Most of the times things that virals are stuff that they don't know. So how do you actually know what they know? So the thing is, um, you have to keep trying, you have to keep experimenting because if you know what you know and, and, you, re- and you think that they resonate with what you know until you can build your brand and build your niche, you got to keep trying and you got to, it's, it's initially it's quantity before quality and then quality comes in, yep. you know, so virality is this, you, you never, you, you can never pinpoint what is going to viral, you know, yep. so, and you know, like for content creators like you, like you and, and people who are just coming in, you just have to keep putting it out and then, and then, you know, analyze the data and says, hey, you know what, this, I, you know, even timing where you put it, what works, what's, what is the treatment. So quality before quantity, uh, quantity before quality initially, and then you start to drive on the data and, you know, produce better stuff. Yeah. So often failures teach us valuable lessons. So can you recall a failure that later became a stepping stone to your success and what did you learn from that specific experience i wouldn't look at things as failure i i I look at things more as it's only a failure if you keep doing the same mistake over and over again so um i have to retrospect when i left astro in 2019 at my peak you know um a lot of people say, why did you leave? Why did you leave? I left Astro and joined a fintech company as managing director. So when people say, why, you know, and then COVID hit. And so I lost my job then with, with that company at that time. Not lost, they, they sort of were downsizing and I decided to leave. But if you look at it, was it a mistake or was it not a mistake? I think what has happened is, even you, when you retrospect and you think about why you understand, I decided to leave at my high point. I didn't want to, you know. So, and then I joined Media Prima and I turned their business around. Uh, you know, it enabled me to venture into other things. Like I got into corporate training, I got into, I wrote a book. I, you know, I did so many things. So, you, when you look at it at, from that point, most of the times we consider it a failure because of non-preparation or because of, of your, your being emotional, you know. However, if you can extract the learnings, easier said than done, extract the learnings from that point, you know, it suddenly becomes a strength. Because like they say, pressure makes diamonds. Nobody has actually succeeded on a on a flat line. You see what I mean? Yeah. It has to have an ebb and flow, up and down, you know. Um, like uh, 
Usain Usain Bolt said it it took him ten years to you know run a, learn how to run a hundred meters under nine seconds. So nine seconds flat. So, but it didn't happen overnight. So yeah. I never used the word failure. I used the word lessons. So I speak about this a lot. This failure has got a it makes you it, it's like a subservient term that you feel like you know you failed. You know. Yeah. I like the word learn. So usually, even when I sit with my staff and I talk to them and say, "So, what's the learning for this? What do we learn from this?" You know. So rather than you fail, you know, it doesn't go, it didn't go as we planned. But what do we learn from this? You know. So I guess we, my approach is slightly different. I don't look at failures. I look at learnings because it is a life lesson. It, 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 it definitely is. How old are you? Uh, How old are you? I'm fifteen. Okay, so. I'm thinking you don't have a girlfriend yet, or your father will kill you, or so. Uh, no, I personally re- avoid these type of things. Uh, um, not really interested at this stage. You know, uh, I'm more uh, okay, so, so, in my studies okay. and that type of stuff. Very good. So think about it this way. So when you grow up, uh, you're going to meet various people. You know what I mean. So most people will go through one, two, three, four relationships before they meet the right person. But is that a failure or is that a learning thing? So learning, it's, it's a learning curve. You know, sometimes, you know, you meet the first right one and you still don't know. So you have to, you have to extract lessons from, from these situations yep. and and use it in the next possible position. Yeah. Everything is a lesson. Like uh, I also don't think failures is like a failure. You know, I also have uh, a lot of projects and initiatives I'm running. And when I talk to my team, uh, we recently did this project, uh, or we're still doing it. It's a STEM debate competition. We opened it up to um, a lot of the schools around the region in KL, and we were expecting a lot of signups, and they, that didn't happen. And uh, so when I approached the team, I'm like, you know, what do we learn out of this? What is this? Uh, it's, it's a mistake. Uh, you know, we did not advertise it. Uh, efficiently we did not market it and that was definitely a mistake and but the important thing is that i encourage them that we need to constantly learn from this you know we need to take this in a positive aspect you know what what do we learn from this what is the outcome of this yes yeah, sure we might have, uh, have not have reached our target but what's important is that we learn and move forward and grow with this you know we need to constantly strive uh for improvement like you know live for the hashtag better than yesterday uh motto and it's important that we always view everything as a le- learning opportunity. It's all about that learning curve that we all go through. Uh, you know, whether it's about relationships. You know, where we, as time we are mature, and you know, with these experiences that we have, the different people we interact with, our perspective changes. You know, from a perspective probably as a two or three year old, it's much. It's gonna be. It's gonna be changed drastically from when you were 14, then maybe 20 or 30, right? It's about all the different people that we interact with, we learn from, and it's everything, regardless of what, even if you buy something new, you are learning something, you know? Maybe let's just say you could have negotiated to bring the price down. Maybe you could have done a bit more due diligence when you were dealing with some company, let's just say. Everything that we do, we learn from. And I think that that the point that you did highlight is fantastic and uh, starkly spot on. So moving forward, given your role as a leader, speaker on leadership and a motivational speaker, what principles do you prioritize in your leadership style? And how do you motivate your team, especially during challenging times? Okay. um, First question you asked was what style of leadership do I take if I uh, understand your question? Well, mine's more seven leadership, authentic leadership, level five leadership. So it's it's very transformational as opposed to transactional. Transactional leadership is, you know, I, I go to work, yeah, I give you salary at the end, you do your work, you go home, end of the year, you hope for a bonus and all. It's very transactional, you see? Yeah. So I have no skin in the game. Um, seven leadership is more mentoring, more giving you ownership of what you're doing, more, you know, hand in hand, you know, um, guidance, uh, you know, rather than than as opposed to uh, transactional leadership. So I guess that's where I'm, I might not know all the answers, you know, and that's the mainstay of uh, seven leadership. I might not know all the answers, but I surround myself with people who know and I'm willing to listen to, you know, and guide. Uh, so leaders are like, to me, should be like the uh, uh, the symphony uh, conductor, orchestra conductor. 
might not know you to play all the instruments, but he can, you know, synergize everything, you know, effortlessly, effortlessly and, 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 and so forth. So I guess that's the way it should be. Um, the problem with, with, with leadership is also um, most people expect leaders to know everything and it shouldn't be that way. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, yeah. Leaders should give their subordinates or their people um, so there's a difference between leaders and managers. Managers are task-based, leaders are life-based. So, um, and they should give them the autonomy to be able to, to, to you know, um, make decisions and stuff. Yeah. So what's the what was your second question? I, if, uh, um, it's about um, how do you motivate your team, especially during challenging times? Um, I actually am not a very proponent, a strong proponent or, or, or believer in motivation. Um, I think motivation is very sporadic, you know, it comes and goes. Uh, I rather focus on discipline. I believe that people, when they uh, you apply the discipline daily, even in bad times, just because of the discipline, it works, you know. Yeah. Uh, I tell people, yeah, I tell people motivation is like, oh, you know, you watch this really good movie about something and you're so excited, you're so motivated, you come out and then it fizzles out after two hours. You know, so yeah. motivation is fine, you know, but I prefer day in, day out, just, you know, um, discipline, repetitious, you know, uh, habitual, and, and eventually you will get it because you're most likely not, uh, you most likely you won't be able to make a mistake because of the way you are programmed. So, and, and, and this is the way we undo our bad habits also. Our bad habits is a program. So, um, so how do I motivate my team? I don't, I, you know, we, we, I instill good discipline in them, uh, ask them to embrace it. You know, it's harder. It's, it's changes hard. People naturally, we, uh, program not to change. You know, we don't like change. Yeah. We, we push, change, yeah. you know, we, we hate it. You know, uh, we are advocates of, you know, we don't want to change, you know? And so when you start to introduce, um, these measures, there's a lot of pushback. So you have to do it, like you said just now, you know, better every day, 1% every day, you know, continue to, you know, and, and push the discipline, push the discipline, you know, have you done this? Have you done this? Have you done this? Eventually they'll get it because once they start to get the, the, the rhythm, it's fine. So yeah, I'm not a very big on motivation and I keep saying this, it's, it's just day in, day out, grind, discipline, you know, although I hate doing it, I might hate doing it most of the times, but I do it. Because yeah. I'm just, you know, so yeah, it, you know that, that after, after all this hard work, it's gonna pay off. The reward is gonna, pay off, but you're gonna have definitely. to work consistently. You're gonna have to put in those exactly. hours and grind. You yes. know, the hustler mindset, I would say. Yes, so yes. You exactly. emphasize uh, continuous learning and reinvention. Can you share a specific instance where you, you know, you're embracing change or learning? Something new has significantly impacted your career or perspective. Um. Well, you know, just writing the book was not a joke for me. So I wanted to challenge myself. I got a bucket list. Just I wrote the book and it came out last year and last month. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I post on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, I think I liked it too. So, the book of Jake. Yeah. 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 So it's it's. I challenged myself to do that, and and you know, again, that was not an easy thing to do because you got to commit. So what I did was I called myself out. I said, "Hey, I'm coming out with a book," and I announced it. So because I announced it, and I got to follow through. Yeah. So the way I did it was I decided to um, sort of speak into, into my record on my phone every day and then transcribe it every night. So I had to do it every day. So it became a habit. So while it is it is easier said than done, but because I committed to it, you know, I had to see it through. There were there were times where you know you don't want to do it, you are tired or what, but I said, you know what? I set a t I set a uh, date that I want to get it out. In fact, I got it out before the date. So it's just seeing through this stuff and and relentless about you know um, stuff like that is important. If you if you talk about things that uh, that I'm embracing right now is AI. I'm very excited about AI. I jumped onto it when you know AI technology. Um, I was one of the very first Chat GPT users in this country actually. So. Um, I was just thrilled by it, and then I'm, you know, every day I spend one hour just going through what's new in what's new in you know artificial intelligence and machine learning and stuff like that. So, because I actually believe that uh, whether we like it or not, 
most jobs, 60% of jobs will be sort of reinvented. So, yep, you know, already we're looking at that's very different. Yeah, all, especially in in the creative uh, industry where people are there's a lot of pushback. You know, I believe that you know, voice talents, I believe DJs, I believe even actors, animation, and I believe scripts, I believe all this is going to go. And uh, you know, in fact, even the legal profession is going to go through a renaissance. You know, a massive renaissance, and and and, and it's already happening. But this is a point of pushback and it's a gray area when when legal terms are mentioned you know we're talking about how can i use this how can i but it will happen it's inevitable so i'm very excited about that i'm excited that you know technology where you can take somebody's voice and and you know you can do so much like i mean i so yeah. give you an example like before we used to pay a voice talent to do a commercial right now right now i'm paying the voice talent a yearly fee right fee to use his voice he doesn't even have to come in and record it because I've extracted whatever I have from his voice. I can AI, AI his voice and ask him to read anything I want. So he doesn't have to physically come in. I've paid him his royalties already. You know, it might be half of that or what. But, you know, these are the things that is going to happen. So I'm excited about AI, you know. So that's on my, on, on, you know, a big part of my, what I'm doing right now. So with the, you know, dynamic digital landscape, especially with the rise of AI driven content and generative AI content that you just mentioned, what do you think, um, you know, individuals can take from this or create impactful content today, but specifically in the context of South Asia and Southeast Asia? I don't think there's any difference between South, uh, um, I, South Asia, Southeast Asia or the world. What's happening is just because we uh, we have access to all this information uh, most of us are especially in this part of the world we are faster than most of the rest in fact uh, southeast asia is is especially malaysia we were in the cusp of all these things long before even asia or uh, you know australia and new zealand and, and parts of uk also so um what can we expect is um from this part of the world i think that it, there is a sense of us reaching the rest of the world faster before it was just limited to us accepting the west but you can see already there's such a massive change where you know south korean music indian um, content is going worldwide you know and and i'm excited about that and because we are always looking for the next big trend worldwide yeah? so worldwide so I see it getting more borderless sooner than later. So this is great news for everybody. So if you're, if you're looking at, oh my God, you know, this is going to be hard. No, but I think that right now what's going to happen is even the ability to, to you know, to, to sell stuff goes borderless already. You know, yeah. It's going to happen faster and faster. And I'm excited about that. While, the, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of pushback from, you know, the old brick and mortar shops and you know or, or you know people are still talking oh the past the past but it's irreversible the te this technology is here it's you're it's gonna have to embrace yeah yeah you, you talk about the ray-ban uh meta releasing the, the specs with the oh, you know yeah. the ability to, yeah so you know i have so it's brilliant you know it's brilliant so what's stopping What's stopping, you know, um, voice to, uh, uh, what do you call that, uh, URL commands immediately. Right now, I can just say, hey, Google, can you do this for me? And it appears on my specs. So suddenly, memory-based learning is a thing of the past, you know? Yeah. Well, creative aspects. Yeah, so, you know, my time, it was memory-based learning. We just, you know, kept everything in our head. All the, you know, yeah, I don't need it. Yeah, I don't need it anymore. I can go to Google, I can go to chat GPT I can go to 101 places to get stuff you know yeah. so I guess what's going to be pivotal for us in this part of the world is and I believe that we are faster than most prompt engineering um, yeah. you know prompt technicians prompt techs and, and and this is only to keep getting better so do are we are we uh, uh, ready for it no we'll never be ready for it but it's happening you know it's like we have to you live know, now and we have to like constantly adapt to make sure that uh, yeah. and i i don't think that we will be able to keep up with the pace of how it's changing so quickly uh but we will definitely have to try 
uh, you know, as a group or as a niche, you know, to work together to basically make sure that there's the best possible outcome, not just for me, not just for you, but for everyone around the world. You know, we're going to have to start embracing this technology in different fields, healthcare, education, uh, content creation, everything like, and um, I think that's what's really important is that we're going to need to train people, give them the right skills, give them the right mindset that you mentioned on how they can work with this technology and how they can basically get the best possible outcome from it, which is best. So, so I, I will end with, with the thought. So when you, you, you reach the very salient point, okay so healthcare and all that and and i believe that you know i have a friend who just came back from china who, who's got a tech uh, podcast adam lobo he does a very good very huge tech podcast so he was talking about you just walk into the hospital you pass this and it scans you and it, it gives you all this miraculous stuff about you so that is the present already it's not the future however when we think about this our education system has to change it has, it has to change you know, so the only thing that has not changed is our education system. You know, worldwide. You know, is it a necessity for four-year degree, a three-year degree? Shouldn't the syllabus from mid, uh, from fifteen, from maybe twelve, start to embrace like what China is doing? You know what I mean? Not coding and all this become yeah. essential in school rather than us learning geography and stuff, like memory-based stuff first to regurgitate all this during an exam. So. That to me, the education I believe, I actually believe that in fact the you know unis and all that are going to be completely taken out of the equation if they don't start to think about you know yeah we did you know COVID taught us a lot of things we can do online and stuff like that but do we need a four year uh, you know unless you're doing medicine or stuff like that do we actually need it so that's got to escalate very fast and it needs to start not from the uni phase but also from you know, from school, from from center one to you know center six, and then primary one, primary six, and then your form. That needs to change. It needs to be able to create people to adapt to already the technology, not come out and learn. China is doing that. I, I believe so, that they, they've like completely um, taken students out of the equation because people who are not even part of the education system are making decisions which they don't understand uh, how it'll affect the curriculum or whatever they're teaching students in school. Well, I believe it should be an equal weightage of people who are actually part of the system to give them advice on what might be the best outcome for what they are doing, or you know, look at different perspectives, analyze it before just coming up with a decision or a thought, you know, that needs to be implemented. So I believe that they are not looking at all these different perspectives and possibilities of AI in education. There's a huge potential for it, a huge potential with AI helping teachers, you know, mark coursework, uh, saving time so that they can actually spend more time with students to actually help them understand concepts more rather than memorize those concepts, you know, because understanding is more fundamental than memorizing because once you understand it, it's going to be so much more easier for you to actually memorize it and then regurgitate it that in the test. Well, the regurgitating is irrelevant. They need to focus on making sure that the students understand what they're learning and make sure that they learn skills which are relevant for the time that they live in today. You know, coding and all has completely been booted out when that should be a priority. You know, the world, the future is tech. The future is tech. And they're gonna need to teach students all these life skills which are gonna be valuable, you know, because after they exit school, they're on their own. It's no longer a protected environment that they yeah, are. So so there are two parts to this. One is the tech, one is the soft skills, right? So I believe that both are essentials. Uh, and, and you rightfully, you know, said, you know, all this like stuff you're doing in Tesla and stuff. Like that, you have to ask yourself, how valuable is this stuff outside of uni? Or, you know what I mean? Right? Yeah. So to me, it's a false sense of gratification happening in universities and even schools and stuff. Like that. So how valuable are these skills that you're using? Because the reality is, spend 12 years from primary one to you know to, to year 12 or what and as you come out and i interview most of them they're not ready for to address the real world problems real world issues. they're not even you know what i mean so there is clearly a, a, a you know there's a gap there so what i'm saying is and i read this and i read this joe rogan was talking about it also how china is preparing the, the kids already like you know they are like eight years old nine years old they're doing coding and you know 
they stuff where they, they attach stuff to your head and see where they are focused, where they are not. They get it, you know, data. So I guess, look, you know, we all have the same hours in the day, but does our education system address the 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 fast pace uh, fast pace tech uh, tech uh, you know uh, growth? It doesn't. You know, so what happens is you all come out, and then suddenly there's a gap. So unless that changes fast, we, we we're going to struggle, and that's why you know um, that needs to change. And I've been speaking about this actually quite vocally. I think our education system, you know, it's clear like like last few days Malaysia and the pizza ranking went down again. So you know, so this is memory based, you know and soft skills you know storytelling you know and all that is so important but it's not there you know? yeah yeah uh i think though that's a really or the, that's a that's a fantastic point that you do raise